so far we have studied about infrastructure management and now we are going to touch upon a case study on infrastructure management by the name of udan udan is a scheme of the ministry of civil aviation government of india and the full form of udan is ude desh ka aam nagrik it is a regional airport development and regional connectivity scheme that is rcs of the government of india with the objective of letting the common citizen of the country fly aimed at making air travel affordable and widespread to boost inclusive national economic development job growth and air transport infrastructure development of all regions and states of india at the beginning of the scheme out of total 486 airports 406 were participating unserved airports where well served airports out of 97 non rcs airports and 12 were operational airports out of 18 participating under served regional operational airports with regular fixed wing scheduled flights udan scheme will add to this number by expediting the development and operationalization of india's potential target of nearly 425 unserved underserved and mostly under developed regional airports with regular scheduled flights The scheme basically has two components. The first component is to develop new airports and enhance the existing regional airports to increase the number of operational airports for scheduled civilian flights from 70 total 98 operational including army airports to at least 150 airports by the end of 2018 with regular scheduled flights. Initially more than 100 underserved no more than 7 scheduled flights per week and unserved regional airports will be developed. for which the initial funding of 45000 crores equal to 47 billion or say euro 610 million for the enhancement of 50 regional airports was approved in may 2017 out of the total 70 airports included in round 1 43 are regional airports to be newly operationalized rcs udan operations have commenced from 13 regional airports and additional 12 regional airports are ready to receive flights 18 regional airports still require significant upgradation. The second component is to add several hundred financially viable capped airfare new regional flight routes to connect more than 100 underserved and unserved airports in smaller towns with each other as well as with well served airports in bigger cities by using viability gap funding that is VGF wherever needed. Initially, three separate rounds of bidding for the award of routes were conducted by the end of 2018. Union government share of viability gap funding is from the cess applied to flights to popular routes to main cities and respective state governments have also offered additional benefits to the flight operators to make udan rcs viable so far three phases have taken place and subsequent phases with the inclusion of sea planes will boost the number of potential landing sites from nearly 500 airports to over 5 lakh water bodies as well as more locations along india's 7000 km long coastline SpiceJet a prominent airline has already placed US dollar 400 million order for 100 of these 12 seater amphibian seaplanes in December 2017 Udan RCS is both enabler and beneficiary of other key government of India schemes such as Bharat Mala Sagar Mala dedicated freight corridors industrial corridor Bharat Net Digital India and Make in India national e governance plans startup India and stand up India India has 394 unserved and 16 underserved airports out of a total of these 410 potential target unserved and underserved regional airports INR 4500 crore has been approved in 2016-17 union budget to revive and further develop 50 airports in the smaller regional towns between 2017 and 2020 15 airports during 2017-18 and other 15 airports during 18-19 and 20 more airports during 2019-20 are supposed to be developed a total of 75 airports were operationalized for the civilian flights in india since independence and government has newly operationalized additional 36 regional airports for the civil flights including three civil enclave with army airports with regular scheduled flights eventually they will operationalize a cumulative total of 100 regional airports by 2018 and this is very well under control and by the end of 2019 we'll have more than 100 regional airports operational In continuation to the tourism infrastructure in this particular session we are going to study about number 1 we are going to understand the concept of standardization and its role in the promotional thrust of marketing a destination 
Number two, appreciate the role of infrastructure in customer satisfaction as an important criteria in the demand-led tourism system. Firstly, we will understand the international standards in infrastructure. Tourism in the modern period grew and expanded in Western Europe and America and 80% of the international tourism is concentrated in these areas. Western European countries are also the number one tourist generating region for India. The top 10 tourism destinations did not include third world countries up to a very recent past but now countries like Thailand and Malaysia are coming up in the top 10 tourist receiving countries. Similarly, these destinations are also the main tourist generating countries. Tourists therefore demand services that are accustomed to at home. Thus, we have seen that the western style hotel replaces the traditional accommodation and air transport replaces rail and road transportation. This is because the quality of the latter conform to Indian standards which are of a lower order than those which have been developed for the sparsely populated industrialized countries which have access to and utilize 60% of the world's resources. But I'm happy to say that of late our standards are becoming of international level. All the world's major chains of hotels are coming up and having a beeline to invest in India. Similarly, the roads, the railways and the airways we are having are slowly and steadily catching up with the international standards. Similarly, air conditioning, running hot and cold water, safe drinking water and western standards of hygiene are an inescapable consequence of wanting to be a part of the global tourism market. We are happy to say that we are also coming up with the international standards in hygiene. The National Action Plan and Non-Plan is quite clear that its objective of having 5 million international tourists for whom special tourist area was created in the 1992 has long been attained and in the year 2018 we have had international visits to the tune of 14.5 million tourists coming to India. Similarly, through the National Action Plan of 1992 and the tourism policies of 2002 and of course now we have a draft tourism policy 2015 which is yet to be converted into a full-fledged declared policy, lakhs will be spent on upgrading golf courses like in Mumbai, Delhi, Jaipur and Hyderabad along with few new golf courses to come up with Goa and the Northeast to provide various sports facilities of international standards which are now determined by the Japanese and the Americans. We are also having a golf tourism as a separate niche tourism product being offered and Ministry of Tourism, Government of India is also uh, doing a lot to market golf tourism in India. I'm happy to say that we also have National Golf Tourism Association of India wherein the various travel agents and the tour operators who offer golf tourism packages to the international clientele are a part of that particular association. The National Action Plan completely ignored the theoretical guidelines that the quality of the life of the community strengthens the quality of tourist-oriented products. We believe that the quality of the local population will also reflect on the quality of the products and services given to the international tourists and the domestic tourists. Therefore, NAP does not prescribe any investment for domestic tourism services except at pilgrimage centers. But we have various schemes nowadays like Sudesh and Prashad schemes wherein the places which are of historical importance we've had a scheme called Hriday as well. So these three schemes are the schemes wherein Tourism Ministry and the Ministry of Urban Development are investing a lot of money to bring up the infrastructure at these cities up to the international level. The leisure and pleasure aspect of domestic tourism is ignored because India standards are assumed to be compromisable. But this has not been the case over the last few years. Even domestic tourism have started asking for international standard services, which in a way is good because what we create for domestic tourists can also fetch for the international tourists. Often one hears views like if a hill station is crowded in the summer and no accommodation is available, I am not worried. The domestic tourist will sleep in the car or find his own way. It's the international tourist who must be provided for because he spends money. This thought has been changing over the last couple of decades. Because more than the international tourist, it is the domestic tourist who is spending a lot of money in the country. Now domestic tourists may even spend more than the international tourists coming to a country because with the disposable income in hand, People are more and more traveling, though the duration of their travel is lessened over the period of time from say 7 to 10 days now to 3 to 6 days, 
but still people have more disposable income in hand so they have more tours earlier they might have one or two tours in a year but now they very frequently visit various domestic destinations thus this leads to a pressure on the third world destinations to organize standardize and manage the supply aspect since tourists are now moving out of the last periphery to see quality experiences at lower prices there is a lot of competition between various countries in asia as well who are trying to attract people from the western countries western europe the european countries americas and of course india is one of them to give them competitive prices to make this possible states and governments are being advised by the intergovernmental organizations like the unwto to standardize their services and improve their quality to meet the social and psychological needs of the international tourists now we will touch upon the topic of management of infrastructure in this section we shall look at primary sectors like energy to develop a blueprint energy is the most essential to the tourism product many people have been critical of energy consumption and distribution to the tourism sector users have also demanded lower rates to ease the product within the competitive prices at other destinations solutions to the problem of energy should be brought in the research for alternative sources of energy and in the implementation of conservation measures the alternative to thermal or diesel sources include solar energy sources wind energy sources hydro power sources and tidal wave sources i'm happy to announce that Kochi Airport in India or the Kochi Airport in India has become the world's first airport to completely generate its energy needs through solar power. It not only generates its requirements but also has surplus power in store which it is selling commercial basis. Now this is one example which can be emulated in other airports of India as well and we might see a day when all the energy requirements of the airports or other such tourist infrastructure can be created by themselves through the use of wind power or solar power or hydro power or tidal wave resources in which india has abundance of such type of resources however research in alternative energy sources has not come up with any viable commercial form other than nuclear energy which has problems of safety but of late solar power has been generating a lot of buzz and every other infrastructure or a hotel or even roads are trying to come up with the solar powered lights and like the example of cochin airport other airports and other infrastructure can also create for their own requirements the buzz is also there that highways and expressways can have lots and lots of solar power batteries and they can generate the power which can be sold off commercially as well as can be used for the infrastructure lighting up in a low energy society the consumer must be made aware of the high cost of providing energy for services given to the consumer to avoid our less waste and to sensitize the tourists to the problems faced by such societies we are having such type of things wherein we call responsible travel behavior wherein the accommodation people prompt the tourists to use the water and the electricity wisely adjustments made in transport through the application of energy efficient technology are not only possible but also prevalent in today's world the location and management of facilities and services can reduce losses and waste through proper planning and use of quality materials and an ingrained maintenance culture so that extensive travel does not create extensive demand for energy it is high time that tourism and the tourists also realize this thing that their visiting to a particular place will create an extra demand for the energy which maybe the local population is deprived of So to create a synergy between the demands and supply for the local population and for the tourism industry it is imperative that the tourists also behave in a responsible manner if we cannot create energy then we should at least save energy so that it becomes available for the local population and for the future generations to come certain steps to lessen on the demand of energy by the tourism to be initiated are number 1 shift static users of power to alternative resources combine business and pleasure trips and hence we have a new term called pleasure which is a combination of business plus leisure so a lot of people going abroad or maybe going within the domestic circuit for business purposes also club their business with pleasure 
and hence we have tourism as well as business being taken together this can reduce the energy resources and use as well combine carriers to reduce waste rather than encourage individual transport so we have the concepts of cab sharing we have the concept of sharing of the transport people pool in their cars to go to the offices or maybe to go to their various places as well if i want to go to a place and i'm just two person in a car it is advisable that i pool in the car with two three more people so that the energy wasted is reduced and we can have less cost and less bearing on the environment as well then comes point number 4 locate accommodation units near the transport terminals this becomes useful so that you spend much less energy on the transportation from transport terminals to the place of your accommodation number 5 integrate terminals of different modes to avoid waste by individuals this integration of terminals becomes a very important place and nowadays whatever planning is being done for infrastructure and transport development integrated terminals have become a very imperative part of it develop tourism circuits to shorten distances of tours we have various circuits nowadays through the schemes of ride prasad and so on various tourism circuits have been developed by the government of india tourism ministry they are being made popularized so that the destination and the origin point becomes one for a circuit to be covered these circuits are on the basis of various cultural aspects or religious aspects on the basis of uh, the symmetry of places and so on so if we have good tourist circuits then people will be traveling less and hence they will be using less of energy and they will be happy to cover up various places of the same inclination then consolidate or cluster developments at resorts for easy access and energy conservation number 8 is to enhance attraction in cities where infrastructure is strong and historic sites buildings museums theaters sport facilities unusual events and cultural attractions and local industries are well developed now these enhanced attractions can be a part of the circuit as well in many countries toll systems on roads discourage individual users this is not the case as far as india is concerned but we can very well move to such a scenario where toll on individual users may be higher so that we promote car pooling and use of similar transport by many people not go by individual cars similarly car pools reduce pressure on petroleum resources In national parks automobiles are parked at the entrance and battery operated or petrol operated vehicles or mass transit systems or walking are preferred more in all the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries of india moving by your own vehicle is not allowed and plying of diesel vehicles is strictly banned so they have mass movement vehicles such as canters or maybe alternative vehicles like gypsies wherein six or more people can sit together and go for the nature trail however alternative tourism which seeks a more authentic experience for the tourists often puts an unsustainable pressure on the energy system so we have alternative tourism but that will also create a pressure on the energy system in such cases local traditions should be relied upon and low energy consumption could be the natural attraction just like the example of canter or a gypsy wherein at least six people are taken together so that individuals do not roam around in different vehicles and use more energy if we pool in we have minimum number of people sitting in a vehicle in national parks and wildlife sanctuaries the use of energy will be less similarly concentration and clustering at resorts can often impose urban architecture and an outlook which destroys natural attraction like a beach a forest or mountains since there is a close relationship between tourism supply and the national economy in a country like india creating and managing the tourism infrastructure in line with international standard is difficult and expensive but of late we have been trying to do and getting up at the international level thus franchising and management contracts provide the necessary know how to achieve the global outlook and i'm happy to say that majority of the projects which are related to tourism infrastructure or infrastructure development in the country are now being developed on a ppp model public private partnership model like we have various highways or we have various expressways 
which are being developed on a PPP model and are being operated by private operators under the various schemes of the government. Now, such arrangements can also include architectural standards, spatial training programs, computer-based reservation systems, brand name recognition. This is popular in the transport and accommodation sectors. For government-owned land, like a national park, agreements with private businesses can be in the form of a concession. The private businesses provides accommodation, food and other services, but under the control of the agency giving the concession. The advantage is that the government can earn revenues without investing in the services and the local economy can benefit from the demand for goods and services. This is probably a win-win situation for everyone wherein the government does not invest money but it gets some sort of revenue. The facilities are maintained by private operators so they also get revenue out of this and it benefits the local population because the facilities are maintained and managed and hence it leads to greater inflow of tourists. Recreational facilities can be created for the public in greater numbers by sharing with the private sector an asset owned by the government but not developed by it. There are innumerable examples in India now where the things are owned by the government but not developed by the government. They are given to the private sector to own, operate and then transfer after the lease period has expired. However, the tourist business is seasonal and the returns from such financial arrangements may be difficult to secure because of the highly seasonal character of tourism industry. Therefore, investors will be difficult to attract. But what we are seeing the trends of the last 10 years that we are doing away with the concept of off season and now we have a peak season or a lean season because there are tourists who come in the so-called off season as well and the number is increasing day by day maybe because of economical and financial gains and maybe because they want to see the country in a less crowded atmosphere. That is why in India in the tourism sector there is a push for foreign investment. Every other foreign chain of hotel is beelining in India to invest in the hotel sector in India because we believe that in the coming 10 years or so, the number of tourists coming to India will be tripled as well as the number of domestic tourism will be doubled in the coming five years or so. That will create a lot of demand for investment in the sectors like hotels, maybe on the roads, investment on taxis and so on. Foreign investment will only flow once government regulations are reduced and the policy towards such investment is stable. Now the latest policies of the government are very much stable and they are a big attraction for the organizations to come and spend money and invest in India. To avoid environmental degradation and public approval, not only a high degree of local participation is required but also on-site supervision by a public agency is at most required. Hence, it becomes imperative to note that the international tourism is highly susceptible to monetary fluctuations. Like we have seen a decline in the exchange rate of rupee or INR vis-a-vis -vis dollars in the past few months. So that has greatly impacted the tourism industry as such. Outbound tourism will become expensive, inbound tourism will become cheaper. So there will be an impact on the tourism industry and the investment that brings in with it. This can also increase the negative risks in foreign investments. With a volatile currency, it discourages people to invest money in offshore destinations. So is the case with India. A lot of foreign investment may be debarred or may be put on hold because of the negative risks involved in monetary fluctuations. People will like to have a stable currency exchange rate to see that whether this investment in India is worthwhile or not. That is the reason why India, like other destinations, is attempting to mobilize investment from its own private sector through a package of incentives to encourage tourism enterprises. There are lots and lots of schemes of the government wherein private sector are encouraged to invest in tourism-related activities and infrastructure development. There are schemes like cheap loans, there are schemes like loan rebates, there are schemes like rebate or concessions on the interest rate, there are tax holidays and so on. So lot and lot of emphasis is being given to attract more investment by the Indian companies itself in the hospitality and tourism industry. Now these may include low interest and long term loans, 
government subsidies for facilities in backward regions or special tourist areas through nap and various other subsequent schemes the government has designated certain special tourist areas wherein investment is virtually free of course lots and lots of loans are being given to the private investors they are being encouraged to invest money so that employment opportunities are created for people and this investment in these special tourist areas will benefit the local economy as well as the investors by attracting more and more tourists so this becomes very good for lot of people to invest in things we've got various financial institutions like tourism finance corporation of india limited who are having money on platter for people to come and take good loans and invest in tourism related infrastructure development then financial agreements like the equity participation tax reduction tax exemption interest rebate duty free imports etc are also prompting and promoting such type of investment by lot of private sector there is another scheme of the government which gives land for tourism and hospitality related projects at a lower cost than the market rate this is a way of inviting people to come and establish like hotels or other accommodation or maybe theme parks so that more and more tourism related aspects are developed and it becomes socially viable and economically viable for the investors to invest money create tourism related aspects infrastructure and benefit the local population as well as the economy of the country all these measures should be qualified by the social and economic costs to the nation of investing in tourism supply instead of health or education though health and education are the primary focus areas for any of the government but we should not forget that tourism has a great multiplier effect and it will create a chain of reaction of creating employment and money if more and more investment done in tourism related aspects which in turn will lead to a greater standards of living for the people which in turn can lead to greater health and education as well for the people so investment in tourism indirectly i mean percolates to other sectors of the economy as well and benefits those sectors also so we have seen that whenever we discuss tourism we also come across the term infrastructure many a times we hear that the lack of infrastructure slows down the pace of tourism development etc to make the attractions available to tourists certain basic infrastructure is needed and that basic infrastructure is also needed for the local population to survive well so we have seen in this session we have familiarized ourselves with certain issues related with tourism infrastructure after briefly discussing what is meant by infrastructure in tourism we have discussed the standards of infrastructure and its management various views expressed in this regard have been dealt with in this particular session this unit also pointed out the concern left out in the government policies and infrastructure development and also presents an alternative viewpoint